What's up, guys? Thanks for hanging tight for a second. I don't know what the hell happened. I like turned on my my computer and stuff, and then um like none of my plugins worked. Random. At first, I thought it was just the roadcaster. As you guys know, we always have issues with the roadcaster. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, something with the plugins all together. I think. Are you guys watching? Do you guys have up on the other screen? You got the uh, the Brian Friend and um, Matt Frazier going down right now. I had it up prior. Can we listen to it. Where can we help out? Where can we be a benefit? Yeah, um, trouble, huh? But yeah, we do we do a bunch of stuff like that. <laughs> not not all of it gets posted. Sure. Um, but anyhow, you go check that out. I saw it at the same time. I was like, great. Now I got to compete with Frazier. That ain't gonna happen. Anyhow, thank you for joining me on the show. Um, we got a couple of things I'm going to talk about today. Number one, we'll uh, go into, I thought it'd be fun. I was looking at some of the questions from the Dave Week and Review show that we did last night. And I was like, that might be fun just to go and, and answer the questions as if I was doing the Dave Week and Review show. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll play with some of those questions. And then I have some interesting stuff here for you guys. I kind of made up these, uh, made up some of this numbers here, made up some of this information here as our hypothetical scenario maybe made up or maybe took from 2018. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe they're false. Maybe they're real information. I'll give you guys. Um, you could be the judge of that when we go through. The topic of will the CrossFit Games survive? Will the CrossFit Games survive? I had this on here too. I thought this is comments. It's getting an interaction for this show. This comment's crazy. Centennial Programming. Bryson, Centennial is a CrossFit program. Matt wouldn't like it. <laughs> Fucking dig. That's a dig for sure. Okay, enough of that. So, whatever. I'll listen to the rest of that afterwards. All right, so how's everybody doing? Thanks for it. Chris, I'm here for you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I guess this what's up. Howdy, Judy. Judy Reed, back of napkin math, yes. Manny, I qualified for quarterfinals. Nice job, dude. Way to go. That's cool. You know, I know people, a lot of people had opinions on uh, the 25% coming in and was like, you know, they expanded it's a lot and like it's too easy now or whatever. But I actually thought um, the same. Oh, shit. My bad. And then once, um, once I saw how people, the members of the gym interacted with like the fact that they got to make quarterfinals and we have a bunch more people going through it and stuff this year. I was like, okay, I see it now. That's cool. People were stoked to make it. I'm stoked more people made it. That's cool. CEO Fondle here for me. Thank you. Steven Flores. What's up, man? How you doing? Um, I saw somebody uh, put something up here. Barclay Dale. Suzy, I DM'd you for Taylor versus the world. Awesome, dude. I'll check that out. I coached um, four classes in a row this morning. Damn, it was a long morning. Had 5.30 a.m. class, great group. Had my uh, firefighter academy afterwards, and then I coached the 8 and the 9. Jammed here, had some breakfast. Panicked because none of my shit was turning on. And now I'm here with you fine folks. So thank you for joining me this afternoon. So we'll jump right into uh, the questions of Dave. This is Dave Castro, Week in Review. You guys remember when it used to actually be a week in review, like when he would tell you what was going on and what he was doing, and then it just solely turned into addressing questions. I wonder, do you think that's because there's not like a lot going on right now? Or do you guys think that, um, or do you guys just think that he's just more into the questions? Or is there something secretive? Everything in CrossFit competitions a secret. I don't, I'm kind of over the secretive stuff. I don't know why. As an affiliate owner, I'm definitely over it. Like you're sitting here and you're like, Oh, I wonder how we're going to plan for and deal with quarterfinals. And it's like, well, you're not going to know until you have to actually plan and deal with it. And then they say like, oh, well, we made it nicer for you. So it fits in with the uh, affiliate. You could run it as a class program and everything, which was really cool. I like the fact that they took that into uh, consideration this year. Obviously, we still don't have any information to plan around it, but at least they're taking the affiliates and how the logistics have to go and everything else would uh, <sighs> would take place. Because that's always the hard part as an affiliate owner. Some of these affiliates too, because they did the 25% are in, they have hella people going through them. Hella, because I'm from the Bay Area. Hella. I got made fun of quite a bit for saying that, especially when I was at the games last year. Christian, love those days. Get it, Susan. Yeah, it is It is fun. I do. Like when I get into a groove of having to coach multiple classes in a row like that, it's 
it's fun. Um, Augusta says, are you as good as a coach for the fourth class as you are for the first class? I would like to think so. But for me personally, I stay away from um, having any of my coaches do more than three classes in a row because I do know that your energy level drops. It's hard to hold the enthusiasm. So we have a rule at the gym that um, unless it's an absolute necessity, like, you know, someone's on vacation or we're short coverage that day, then uh, it's three classes in a row at max. Ideally, you do two classes back to back because you always like improve in that second one, right? Because like you kind of get your feeling in the flow down in the first one. You're like, okay, I could do it better on the second one. And then usually we'll have like a break or two throughout the day or you won't coach the next class. And then you'll come in and close coach the third one. Cause it's all about preserving your energy level, your attentiveness, your enthusiasm. Like when you're the coach and you're in front of that class, that whole entire class and the energy on it uh, of it and everything else solely depends on you. Like imagine if you started a class or even this show and I was like, Hey, this is my like fifth class in a row today. I'm dying. Um, go ahead, guys. Oh, here's the workout. Go ahead and grab your barbell. Like, no, fuck that. Like, you got to come in hot. What up? Come to my class. It's like a five minute comedy show nobody asked for. <laughs> or a TED talk. I always make the joke. Sometimes I'll rant in something in front of the class and then they're all staring at me like, dude, it's not a podcast. What are you doing? And I'm like, thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, Stephen Flores Souza, when during the day do you do your fitness? So that just depends. Typically, I'll do it in the middle of the day, one to three when the gyms close. I'll work out with Grace. I'll work out with Albert. Like we'll kind of uh get into the we'll just do the class workout. Maybe they do some extra stuff. I typically never do extra stuff anymore. I just do my programming at the class. Um, lately I've been coming into the afternoon and working out with my classes. So like I'll work out with the three 30 class, uh, yesterday I worked out with four 30 class today. I'll work out with four 30 class and I've really been enjoying working out with the classes. And that's pretty much what I've done for the last eight years. There's maybe a period of time when I, um, when I would do like extra outside programming because I wanted to be competitive and then would also maybe work out with the class with the Metcon or whatever. But yeah, I, um, a workout with my class. Yeah, I do the class programming. Uh, Bailey Walker, I think he only just wants to do it for a certain amount of time and the questions are taking too much time. You're probably right. He probably wants to keep it to like 30 minutes or so. Um, I guess this Chris, Chris Cooper talks to us about uh, needing a break after X hours depending on the individual. Um, that's, yeah, 100%. Yep, yep, yep. I agree completely. Um, Austin Hartman, my second class is always my best class. Totally. Right. Like you get your flow down, like you, you got it together. You, you made adjustments in the warm up to maybe like logistically make it work better or make it like logistically, like move a little smoother or something like that. But yeah, our coaches do mostly three, usually two. That's about the right number. That's about the right number on average is, uh, uh, how many times on average a day do you have to say, stop complaining and work harder to myself? a lot because <laughs> you know as you know i have a lot of things going on and sometimes i could easily kind of get a little poopy pants attitude about it um i saw another one of these questions up here that i wanted to answer um susie you should come out to the two brain summit in june you could do behind the scenes to promote two brain interesting you mentioned that christian interesting you mentioned that not saying I am, not saying I'm not, just saying interesting you mentioned that. Uh, Clang and Bang, thoughts on all coaches needing to be taking classes weekly? I, I, I do fall into that camp. I think that if you're um, the affiliate owner, if you're a coach, you do need to be doing you know the programming. You do need to be taking your own classes. You, you have to. If you have other personal goals outside of that, that's fine. But find a way at least once a week to get in there with a class and work out alongside your people. There is like if we get in a stretch or I get in a stretch of working out during the middle of the day because that's just what the time allows for me. I know that um, when I come into a class, a ton of people will uh, mention and be like, oh, it's cool that you're in class with me. Oh, cool. You're working out with me. So like Sometimes as coaches or as affiliate owners, we forget how important it is to sweat alongside the members or sweat alongside the people that we coach uh, every day. I do think that that is a um, that is an important thing to to do. Yeah, I mean, and I'm I get it. You have your own goals. Maybe you have you know competitive goals, or you're working on something. That's fine, but still find a way to get in there and sweat next to your people. I do think that that is important. It's not the only thing you you have to do all the time, but it but it is important. Um, 
Christian, if you come, I'll, I'll buy you dinner with the Sandy. Well, shit, who could pass that up? Kidding me? Count me in. Uh, Jake Felton, hey, Susan, any talks of getting CrossFit down to Indy for FDIC? CrossFit down to Indy for FDIC. Shit, dude, you're going to have to help me out. I probably know exactly what you're talking about, but I can't decipher it from that um, acronym. Uh, hold on. Is this actually true? Is this, this is going to, okay. So uh, Matt Frazier on Be Friendly has 151 people watching and I have 123. That's fucking incredible. I'm so pumped about that stupid, silly, corny sound effect because of that. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, took the words out of my mouth with the week in review being a QA and a basically now. Yeah, it definitely is. It used to kind of give you this whole like, oh, so I started out with this. I was over here, you know, traveling and doing this, working with this person. Now there's none of that. Now it's just directly into questions. But Bailey made a good uh, observation and said that maybe he just tries to get through a bunch of them. Um, FDIC is a firefighter conference. Oh, cool. Oh. Big firefighter conference. Shit, I don't even know about that. God. I should go down there for that. I'll look into that. I need to get some more details. That's cool. Firefighter or fire department instructors conference. Damn, yeah. How do I get involved with that? I don't get the problem with that. Um, do not set the bar that low, Susan. Compare yourself to BF. No, no, I was comparing myself to Matt Frazier. <laughs> comparing myself to Matt not Frazier. And that was stupid anyways. Oh, you guys, this is a trip. Okay. So, um, a year or so ago I started this book and then for whatever reason, I like sat it, I like set it down and then got distracted with other shit and then picked it back up, uh, uh, like a month ago and finished it off. I'm not, I'm not recommending you read this unless you're into like Apple or whatever, but the line at the beginning, how Apple became a trillion dollar company and lost its soul and the differences between the company going from Steve Jobs to um, Tim Cook, who's now the CEO, the parallels between like Greg Glassman kind of being that Steve Jobs like figure and then leaving the company. We know Steve Jobs passed away, but um, that transition from like the founder, the innovator, the disruptor, like leaving and then like the business man, for lack of better words, like stepping into it and how it's changed the company Apple versus like what's happening in Cross right now. Right now it's crazy some of the uh, parallels um, between that. But like I said, I'm not recommending you read that unless um, you're into like Apple and learning about uh, companies because otherwise you will get you will get so bored. You will get so bored. Um, now get with the programming is live too. You guys doing it to us? No, I mean, I don't know. They have their times. Everybody has their times and we just kind of do our thing. It is what it is. It'll be hard to like schedule all of them across. And I feel like in within that crowd, within the get with the programming, the Hiller shows, um, the, uh, coffee pods and wads, like all that. Like I'm, I'm kind of low guy on the totem pole, just getting started here. So they all get precedence of the timing over me. And unfortunately this is the only time that I have. So here we are. All right, let's get into some of these comments. Um, Dave's week in review for the upcoming week for one. Can you guys see those? Okay. I mean, obviously I'm going to read them, but, um, okay. So let's find the first one that's actually a comment. These are all just basically kissing Dave's ass. Um, hi, Dave. Love how you do those drop-ins to support local affiliates. Have you ever considered doing this internationally, say in Asia or Australia? Also would be great to bring back the CrossFit Invitationals. To me, that was the highlight of the season back in the thing. Uh, when it was back, back when it was a thing. Yeah. So... I would imagine Dave stops into all the CrossFit gyms when he's traveling, but to travel specifically to Asia and Australia, especially like in the se in the season where we are with the games and stuff right now, I I don't see him doing that specifically to drop into those gyms. But I do know that I would say out of everybody that's worked at CrossFit HQ, Dave's probably dropped into the most CrossFit gyms. That would be an interesting stat, but I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like, um, He's probably, he's probably been the most, um, turntables. Apple hasn't ha uh, had an innovative product since Steve passed away. Yeah. And that's all in the book and it talks about it, but now it's like a $4 trillion company. It's insane, but yeah, no innovation in a long time. Um, find another question here. Not a lot of questions. People just kind of like comment about it. Huh? Hey Dave, big fan. Any info on the service cup? 
I saw an article about the prior to the open, but I haven't seen anything since. Should I answer it as if I'm Dave? Um, thank you, T-Bone548. Uh, we're looking into that. Um, the team is in discussions about the Service Cup, and um, I'll get back to you. Hey, Dave, you talked to, uh, talked before about, uh, should I start with the name? Dan Taylor 1896. Hi, Dave, you've talked uh, before about one hours of training not being effective for strength work in Metcons as it's too much to cram in. Do you think lifting slash strength work should be done separate into two sessions for most effectiveness? Now, um, example, an hour 30 uh, lifting slash strength training in the AM and in the PM 30 to 45 minutes Metcon cardio work or mix both together over two hours. Your last question uh, was thoughts on Hydro uh, High Rocks athlete and athletes um, moving over such as Mal O'Brien and Christy O'Connell. What the fuck? Did I screw that up or was that question weird? If Dave, Dave will probably mostly respond in the terms of an affiliate, and here's the deal. If you put in a lot of strength stuff ahead of time and then you put in a Metcon and like your total working time there is like 40 minutes or something like that, you basically leave yourself no time to actually um, coach any members. Because if you're going to go through and give some points of performance and watch some people's movement and give some feedback and stuff like that, if you have like a 40 minute total working time or worse, a 45 minute total working time, because you have this like strength portion and all this stuff, and then you have a longer Metcon, you're basically just hurting cats and like logistically moving them through the steps of the class. That's why in CrossFit.com programming, we've always just seen like just the strength and like just the Metcon. Now, with that being said, that's really hard to, to sell as a business because people want to come in and they want to get strong and people want to come in and they want to sweat before they leave. So you have to find a balance there. Typically what we do at the gym is like three out of the three, maybe four days out of the six days that we are open at the gym, we'll do some sort of strength before, but we'll have some continuity between the strength that you're doing and the lifts that we're doing and the lifts that are happening in the Metcon. So typically if we're doing some sort of front squat or something like that for our strength, you'll have some sort of front squat in the workout. Um, if we're doing like a squat clean in the in the strength, um, then we'll have squat cleans in the Metcon. And then that way, it's a little bit easier. You could teach the movement. You get some time for people to get heavy, to practice lifting it, what have you. And then um, you you know adjust the weight accordingly, and then you start the Metcon. And that makes it easy to get in a little strength and also to um, allow the people to get through a Metcon and sweat without sacrificing um, coaching. Rick Ellis, 68. Hey, Dave, do you think there will be guest programming for main site workouts again? Yeah, that was interesting. They did that for a little bit and then they kind of stopped, right? Um, I don't What Did you guys like the guest programming? I thought it was kind of gimmicky. I mean, it was cool a little bit in theory where they brought people, but all they were trying to do is drive a bunch of more like traffic and attention to the um, to CrossFit main site workouts. Nothing wrong with that, but I, I wasn't like it didn't do much for me. Like so and so's programming. Oh, you know what would fucking blow it up out of the water? Like if they really wanted to uh, draw a bunch of a uh, um, attention to CrossFit.com sites or to, to the CrossFit.com workouts, if they had Hiller uh, guest programming, that would be crazy because everybody'd be like, "What? It's Hiller!" and like would freak out, and then it would that would draw a ton of attention to it. So, um. look through some of those uh questions i guess as we have 36 minutes worth of working time tomorrow it's all going to be time management and rushed yeah and that sometimes that's okay every once in a while that's okay it's the problem is it's like that's the meat and potatoes of your programming every single time then yeah you want to reduce that so you could give your time you give your coaches some time to actually coach the movements um and go through it and give some feedback and get people moving better Uh, so yeah, I don't know about the guest programming stuff, but that might have just been, might have been a flop. Might have been a flop. Uh, you see, see you in Lion in May? Question mark. Okay, I don't know what that has to do with anything. Um, uh, Stephen, Stefan, Stefan, P. Willer. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Pl player, player. Five nine eight three. Hi, Dave. Do you have an ideal CrossFit athlete in mind? For instance, are you trying to steer the direction of people 
programming to heavier emphasis on conditioning or perhaps higher skill in volume gymnastics. The community has put so much emphasis on weightlifting throughout the years. It makes me wonder if you see a deficiency in other areas. That's a good question. I, I wonder if, um, I, that's a good question. I, I think that they would probably look at the programming in total and start to fill in holes. Like we've seen it go really high, heavy weight, weightlifting. And then we've also seen it swing the other way and go like more emphasis on high skill. So I think as long as it's balanced and when you look, when I say balance, you look over the totality of like the games test and the whole season. And then you look out at the totality of maybe the last few years as well that um, I'm sure Dave is paying attention, close attention to that and is making adjustments necessary to make sure that there's not too much of an emphasis placed on one or the other. And if there is, usually it'll swing the other way and it'll balance it out over time. Uh, Dan Gall 81. Hey Dave, is there a reason we've never seen any kettlebell movements in the open in the quarterfinals? Yeah, dude, think about it. How are you going to judge that? If you're going to say like a straight arm and like over the head, like you do have to cover the ear. Do you see the ear come through the other way? I mean, you guys seen the people that do the kettlebell swings and they like, their arms stay bent the whole time and they're like duck underneath it or some weird shit. I think in terms of movements for quarterfinals and open or matter of fact, any movements that you're doing where you're doing it in an online setting, it has to be super cut and dry. Meaning like I started on this side of the box. I touched the top of the box. I ended on the opposite side of the box. Rep was clear. That's why you never really see pull-ups in the open or anything either, because you have to go from hanging low to your chest hits the bar, right? Clear contact points, clear, easy things to look for. That's why you'll probably never really see like in the open for, for that matter, like running or rope climbs or certain movements like triple unders or something like that. Like where there's too much of a gray area in terms of judging it, that's, it just gets tough. And it's already hard with clear and cut dry standards, let alone mixing movements in there where you could easily blur the lines. So I would say we probably, I would say we won't see it and then watch it show up in quarterfinals this year. <laughs> but yeah, anytime there's a lot of gray area. Um, hey, Dave, can you provide your review on Matuthian powder? Fuck yeah, Fall Dawn. Look at this. Got mine today, boy. Look at that. I'm excited to try it. I hyped it up yesterday. If you guys listened to the show and I was like, I'm going to go live and try it like super early in the morning. But I realized I left it at the gym. I ship everything to the gym easier makes it gets it there it doesn't this apartment complex sometimes gets uh packages disappear but not at the gym but then i left it there so i got up this morning and wasn't able to rock and roll with my matuthian but we'll give it a try tomorrow oh that is clever chris that is <laughs> that is clever <laughs> um yeah maybe again oh i think we already read the mountain lion thing and we were joking because we we're like 12 daily doses was super nice to that. Um, okay. Uh, baby Sandy's. Can you say after reading the questions, if it comes from someone from the U S or other continents, I have a feeling that from most of the topics and how it asks, it becomes obvious if it is a U.S. or non U S question. Thank you for your reviews. Well, that's a non U S question. <laughs> Because <laughs> we can't, that was fucking jumbled, Don Fall. Uh, hi, Dave. Have you had the opportunity to catch a weekly season show on the set on podcast? Oh, you guys are great. You guys are great. <laughs> I, I, I'd be willing to bet everybody uh, one jar of Matuthian. He completely ignores all the uh, comments that have my name in it. Um, Houston, Texas, 94. Dave, question about constantly pushing to an affiliate. I live in a small town that has one CrossFit affiliate. Great gym. I used to be a member and it cost $150 for a family package with no child care. A must when you have a nine-month-old. We got our YMCA, which got $65 a month for a family. Where the fuck are you where it's $150 for your family? Like two people? Is that what that means? And you're paying $150 each or together? It costs 65 a month at the YMCA for a family with childcare, and they have a class that all the coaches are L1s and follow mayhem programming, and they push the open. What is that about? Call the lawyers, y'all. Call the lawyers. <laughs> you better make them affiliate, um, and they push the open. 
when are the uh when there are gyms that could provide an a near identical product community result for a fraction of the cost can you give me a reason why you believe an affiliate is still justifiable besides that it helps crossfit go grow which i completely understand dude you found your solution what do you mean no he's going to say go to some other places that are stealing the methodology not even taking it from uh mayhem and doing it in their gym when they're not even a uh, licensed affiliate like what i do you guys get this question i'm not i'm not what this question chase hi hey i heard you guys have a show what's happening we got to coordinate um uh bernie what's up dude finally a question the review crew can get behind a rando who gets it and is not a tard. <laughs> I immediately judge gyms that don't do their own programming. We might have a similar thoughts in that, Christian. We might have similar thoughts in that. Um, okay. So back to this. Yeah, did you guys get that question? I don't understand. He's like, he's basically saying, like, why are you pushing people to CrossFit? Because he works for fucking CrossFit, dude. And the CrossFit affiliate ship is their bread and butter of revenue. And if CrossFit affiliate starts to dive too much, meaning a decline in people affiliating, they don't want to pay the 4,500 bucks. They decide that it's not worth it because they're going to go to some YMCA thing, which is extremely well funded. And uh, they could support bottom dollar costs, like $65 a month for your child care or whatever you need. Right. If that happens, the CrossFit games are gone. If affiliates start, if affiliate starts losing money and it's already, you've already seen a decline in the L1 training. Like those, those seminars are not as full as they used to be by all means anymore, which in my opinion is a, is a, is a fault of like the media and us highlighting it, not the fault of the actual certain in and of itself. But if you're like, come on, dude, he works for the company. Of course he's going to do it. No, no, go to some other place. That's so taking everything we do and not paying for it. I don't, did you guys get that? I don't get that question. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Carlos, Inestor, 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 Inesto. Fuck, I can't talk. Susa, are we going to know the quarterfinal workouts released tomorrow? Yes. I will be doing them here live on my um, show. Yes. Yes. I'll be giving you guys all the quarterfinal workouts. We'll bring in JR to do those. Iron Kid 5, any advice to ensure a CrossFit box programs correctly? Oh, kind of on the topic that... uh. You guys are on in the comments here. Um, can members report it to HQ? Damn, out here snitching, dog. What are you going to say? What? How does that... Hold on. Ernesto. Thank you, Carlos. I don't know why I couldn't get that out. I had a Joe Biden moment. Gigi <laughs> Ping. Um, uh, any advice to ensure a CrossFit box programs correctly? Can members report it to HQ? <laughs> My current gym has horrible workouts and seems like over the last 24 months, multiple members have had shoulder and back injuries. Oh, shit. Workouts are never shorter than 25 minutes. Okay. Red flag. Skills are taught during the workout. Like in real time? Hmm. I've come across some old members and they say CrossFit caused the injuries, which is not right if the head coach lacks the knowledge. Very true. What's the reply here? Uh, 25 minutes is too long for Matt Cons consistently. Um, coach is a smooth brain. That's a nice, that, that's like a nice insult, right? A smooth, a smooth brain. Um, yeah, that sucks. No, I don't like I uh, the reported to HQ part is like you have to remember it's a licensing model. So even if somebody called CrossFit headquarters and somebody actually like I, who would that be? Jada Coons or something picked up and he's like, "Hello." And they're like, "Hey, this pro this program sucks." Like I don't think there's much that they could do other than just suggest maybe you look for another gym. Um but if the workouts are never shorter than 25 minutes, that's already a huge red flag. Obviously, everything should be constantly varied. Your time includes with that. You should have seven-minute, five-minute workouts. You should have 30-minute workouts and everything in, in between. 
And you could easily analyze a, a gym's programming. Like if it's public, like ours is public, like you could just go find it and you could just start looking through all my workouts and you can easily see if it's balanced. Like how, what do the time domains look like? Are they going short, medium, long? Um, what's the range of different movements that are in there? How many days are you below parallel? How many days are you pulling? How many days are you pushing? Like it's, it's pretty easy to look at a program and determine like, hey, does this person actually know kind of what's going on here? Or um, do they have their own biased or do they have or do they, do they just lack the knowledge of the methodology that could be very true too there's been lots of times where i've talked with coaches that have been doing it for a while and they'll talk about some workout that they're either programming or that they're going to put in the gym and when i afterwards i hear them say they're like yeah this one will be good because it's just this one's going to be hard this one will screw them up and you're like what that's your intention that there, there's zero intention. Every workout's hard. You could just sprint a back and forth a bunch of times and it would become hard. Like there should be some sort of intent. There should be some sort of like something in your program, in that workout that day, that is the emphasis. You should know the stimulus. You should decide like, hey, this is going to be, you know, low heart rate, but super like muscular fatigue. We're going to work some dumbbells. People are going to get super sweaty. This one's going to be really high heart rate. It's going to have your, you know, uh, out of breath super quick. It, the reps are fast and light. So it keeps you moving. Like if you can't intelligently explain what the intention of your workout is to anybody who asks the question, then you're, you're not really programming. You're just kind of randomly putting workouts up there. And, uh, I've had, it's funny. I've had conversations cause I, I love to nerd out about it. I don't talk a lot of programming here publicly with you guys or anything like that. Um, just for, there's lots of other shows that do that. There's lots of other uh, people, Taylor, JR, Chase, Bill. I mean, these guys are freaking great at it. So I just don't need another guy talking about it. But um, you could tell right away if you ask somebody about their workout and they don't have any intention behind it and they can't intelligently explain what they're doing, why they're doing it, how it relates to the other workouts on the mix, like run. Especially if you want to get involved with any first responder stuff, you have to be able to justify your workouts as to it relates to their job tasks. And if you can't, then you'll get tore up. You'll lose trust super quick. So yeah, uh, Iron Kid, go go shop around, find another gym. Um, Plugga Nine DP. Hi Dave, you have you are adamant on the you should go to affiliate statement. Hi Dave, are you adamant? Sorry, are you adamant on the you should go to an affiliate statement? I'm an L3 trainer and plan on doing my L4. Been coaching CrossFit and doing CrossFit for 10 years. I own a small box and where I stand, I no longer feel aligned with CrossFit HQ and I don't feel comfortable giving my money to private equity. Damn. On the other hand, I have visited many affiliates where classes and coaching were are, uh, are shit. And even some affiliates where coaches say the L1 guide is nonsense. I believe I'm a great ambassador to the CrossFit ethos. Everything I do, I do it because that's how the L1 guide told me to. I'm in charge of a thriving and happy community of 80 plus members. Congrats. But because I'm not affiliated, would you just blindly discard the work I've been doing while blindly supporting affiliates who talk, sh who do a shit job and are actually driving people away from CrossFit? That's going to be interesting how he answers that, right? Because at first I, I was like, okay, we're just going to throw this dude's thing. But then when you read the rest of it, you're kind of like, oh, shit. But here's the answer he's going to give. Hi, I work for CrossFit, so become a CrossFit affiliate. Like, with the, you know, you're asking him kind of to answer an impossible question, especially in a public setting there. Um, but that is interesting. That is interesting. But yeah, of course, you should stay within the CrossFit affiliates. and. Um, is, is what Dave will say. And, uh, you know, the ones that aren't up to par, you would just say that the free market would take care of that. Like if your gym shit and your programming isn't bad or your program is bad and, um, you know, you're not really doing the right things for the right reasons for your people inside there, like eventually they'll leave and find something else, you know, either way. And the fact that it's all kind of lumped into like, it's driving people away from CrossFit, dude, here's the deal. There's the Starbucks right up the street from my house that sucks. There's a Starbucks 10 minutes up the street from the house that's better. There's one in Dublin that I passed by that's excellent, right? So like, of course, even within that much of control with a franchise where, I mean, everything is done to a spec the same way across every Starbucks across the world, you're still going to have ones that do well 
and you're still going to have ones that do shitty. So this whole control type thing, or like the last comment said, like call HQ to report it or something like that. It's just a fantasy of the fact if we all did the same thing the same way, we would all, they would all be great and they would all be an equal product. And just, unfortunately, that's just not the case. Even if you try to set it up that way, it's not the case. Um, but yeah, so I think he's still going to say, go to a CrossFit affiliate. Okay. Um, that's just a comment, but I'm just, so just, I just scanned this and all as I saw the thing was like best on your Bible journey. I will say one thing. I feel like Dave has talked about his journey with the Bible quite a bit more than I've ever heard him talk about any other book. And, um, in the way that it relates to like how he's feeling and how he's acting and how he's perceiving things, which I find that very interesting. And it's funny because when he had said that a while back, I think on one of the shows with Sevon, I was like, hey, I'm going to try to find, um, you know, one of the uh, audible things for the Bible that gives you like a X amount of verses in a day. Um, so you could get it done within a year or something like that. Right. I got brutally corrected by <laughs> you Bible thumpers in the comments that you can't do it in a year. I get it. But um, um, it's funny because I don't really like I, that thought was kind of swirling in my head, mostly because you guys in the comments say it all the time. So like it's been pretty prevalent for me, too. I've never read read the Bible. And uh, then when Dave did, I was like, oh, well, maybe we'll all just like listen to it or something. And it's, it's funny how you like monkey see monkey do, right? Especially for people that we uh, look up to and respect. Oh, you know, I wonder if I'll get in trouble for this. I wonder. Let me think about it. I want to show you guys part of the video that um, I made for Dave, which nobody else has uh, seen yet. But I'm wondering if, I, if I'll get in trouble for that or not. Should we fucking, should we do it anyways? I don't know. We'll see what you guys think. Okay. Um, more of just... This person just commented strict pull-ups. LOL. Any top athletes who do strict pull-ups more than you can. Uh, thanks for commenting. Novel of Autumn Hunter. Yeah, that just strict pull-ups and four people commented on it. That's interesting. I could still do more strict pull-ups than you, says this commenter. Like imagine getting in an argument with somebody like who could, who could do more who could do more of them than than you can on the internet. Climate change, LOL, stay in Cali, no doubt. Okay, cool, cool. Oh, that's the end of it. Dave, Dave uh, uh, D Wizzle seventy seven. Does Dave not believe in climate change with the two eyes? Oh yeah, because if he doesn't, we could we could judge him. And we could label them something. Oh, yeah. Believe what we believe or, or we hate you. Okay. Anyways. Okay. So that was Dave's Week in Review. Um, now we'll watch it to see how many. Um, now we'll watch it to see how many questions he answers that I answered. I love that Doug always joins in. <sighs> Only reason I watch. Yeah, exactly. You guys know. You guys know. Hey, it's Augustus. I like the response to the guy doing CrossFit, not an affiliate. Thanks, Dave. I like that response, too. like that. That was funny. That was funny. Okay. Well, there you go. 48 comments as of Tuesday. I wonder how many more there will be, and we'll see which ones uh, he answers that I answered. Cool. Okay. Hi, Dan. Captain Rogers, what's up, dude? Uh, Rosie V photography, you could definitely do it in a year. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Appreciate that. Chris, it's just us. Recency bias. You could read the Bible in a year. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for believing me. Tyler, do it. Only 118 of us promise we won't say anything. Okay, deal. Okay, deal. Deal. Um, hey, I just got a comment notification that someone liked my comment. <laughs> real time, dude. All right, here. Liking comments in real time. Bernie Gannon. I always like Bernie's. Bernie, I always respect your uh, the thoughtfulness you put into your comments. Like sometimes I'll just see you out there on like in the CrossFit ecosystem on other random shows or different things I'm checking out. And I see your comments and they're always thoughtful. That's good. Uh, Dave speaks in code and parables. Yesterday's affiliate question answer was about the one true church. The mountain line answer was uh, really about BLM. Bernie, reading between the lines there. Bernie reading between the lines there. I understand Castro's answers could be skewed towards him supporting the brand. Of course, he works for them. That's who that's who cuts his that's who cuts his checks. 
Um, but I also believe HQ could support coaches, just not affiliates. Completely agree, Alejandro. Completely agree. I've had like, um, I've had like so many, uh, that's me. And I forgot to live that I, um, uh, and I forgot to, forgot to add that I live in Mexico city. Yeah. Um, going back to your comment here about like, uh, HQ should support coaches, not just affiliates. I dude, I completely agree with that. I think that like, I think CrossFit's biggest asset is education is the L ones to the L fours. You guys have heard me rant on this, but I think they could even spill over into, I think there's multiple different places that they could go with, uh, um, with that education. I think they should be the hub of like exercise science and nutrition and everything else. And I think that that should be where all their attention and time goes because the upsell from that, like you take the cert, I'm all pumped. They got all this education. I want to do something. The upsell from that is the affiliate ship. And the affiliate ship is their, is their um, long-term product. Because once you become an affiliate owner, you might be around for 10 years. You know, you hope, right? And so if you really invest heavily into education and continue to expand it, continue to put a ton of media behind it, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys have heard Stevon and I talk about how you need cameras inside these L1 so they can highlight all the awesome stuff. Like, a hundred percent. That should be where they go. A hundred percent. Um, Chris DB doc has like over 300 K did well. I I noticed that the other day too. Um, yeah, that's doing well. Good for her. That's cool. I, I still haven't seen, I've watched the, like a first portion of it or whatever, but I just haven't, I haven't sat down to, um, to listen to it or to watch it. And typically like, I'll end up listening to some sort of like podcast or something. Did you guys watch the Lex Friedman podcast with, um, he had two good ones, two good ones, Dana White and, uh, uh, Mark Cuban for different reasons. And typically I don't listen to a lot of Lex podcasts anymore. He kind of got boring to me a little bit, but w depending on the guests, like when he had Jeff Bezos on, uh, Dana White was a really good one. Yeah. Dan Guerrero, Dana White was good. It, that was a good one. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, um, uh, depends on the guest he has on, but he's got some really cool people lately. So I recommend you, you do it. Um, uh, Carlos Ernesto got a right buddy. The one with Mark Cuban is amazing. Yeah, it's good. You see the way that he navigated the, the DEI question. I thought about doing a whole show on that this time, just how he navigated that question. It, it was really interesting. He is Mark Cuban is very well media trained. Um, I've always thought Tyler Watkins, I've always thought CrossFit should be the authority in fitness, but that's a scary weight to pick up. It takes balls. And we had it, dude. We had it with the NSCA case. Like that was it. They would have gotten buried if they just didn't settle it and seal it up. So nobody knows what the hell happens. Like that should have been the, um, we should be the authority. CrossFit should be the authority. It has been really, but it could be more publicly the authority. Lupe, my opinion, Dave is uh, talking so much about the Bible because it came up once and now people ask questions out of curiosity. He doesn't really bring it up unless prompted just an observation. Good observation. You're probably right. Uh, discipline equals freedom. Thanks for always leaving the comments after the live show. He's always like throwing one in there for the uh, algorithm. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, Lex is too technical for me. Um, I did watch the Dana, the Dana White episode. Yeah, that's how I feel too. He gets like, it gets a little... Technical. I listen to Lex, but he could be so low energy. Uh, also, all um, the all about love shtick is annoyingly naive. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, we're going to end with this here. Will the CrossFit Games survive? Can the CrossFit Games survive? Put some notes down. Put some notes down for this. CrossFit has two lines of revenue. And I just talked about it. They got the L1. They got certifications. They got courses. Could be summed up in either educate. I think they call it education now. Summed up in education or training. And then we got affiliate fees. Those are the two uh, revenue lines for CrossFit. So then if you would ask yourself, who is CrossFit's customer? Who does CrossFit serve? It should be two things. It should be the affiliate owners first because that's going to be their long-term revenue. If I could keep my affiliate owners happy, I could keep them in business, help them keep them in business. Then I'm going to be able to have a, a really robust long-term revenue stream off my affiliates. How do I get them to become affiliates? 
I certify them first through education. I have them go through the L1. Now within a year, you have to go through your L2. That's not, that's not a bad thing either. I really enjoyed like the L1, L2 combo is killer for coaches. If you're a coach and you've been doing it for about six months, maybe a year, go get your L2. I think it's a great combination. And then after I got all my shirts, certs and training, I become an affiliate owner and boom, those are your two lines of revenue. And then your uh, certification is now reoccurring revenue every five years or whatever it is. So you could get reserted because it does expire. So when revenue is offset by costs and an allocated percentage of total company expenses, only affiliation realizes profit. Because if you think about that, the certs cost money to set up and send people out and rent the space and provide all of that, right? So you have kind of an ongoing overhead expense. But affiliateship, other than supporting the affiliates in terms of like a customer service role, there's really not a lot of overhead on that. Like you could have like a hashtag small team. You could have a small team kind of run affiliate support and make sure that they're processing new affiliates and applications and all that due diligence that happens there. And then once you get them going, it's like, good, just make, just make sure, try to make sure they're happy if you could do that, right? Or try to support them in some way. So a lot less overhead there. Now it doesn't matter that you would take some of the money from affiliate ship to invest that into training. So for easy math, let's just say affiliates make $100 a year. I could take $25 of that, or I could take even $50 of that revenue, and I could reinvest it into training, whether that's media, advertisement, whatever. I could somehow, I could invest that money into training, um, newer courses, upgrading courses, whatever the case may be. And that's going to be considered an investment because we now know that the path to affiliate ship is through training. So any money taken from affiliates into training is a positive investment into the futures of affiliates. Let me catch up with the rest of my notes here. Now, and again, this is old. I found it on a AI generator. So let's say that you take all your money from affiliates and instead of invest that into training, you invest most of it into the CrossFit Games. Now, if you invest that into the CrossFit Games, don't fall. Breathe, Matt. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? You know where I'm going with this. In the Games expense line, item bleeds. <laughs> exactly. So if you were to take the money from affiliates, if you were to take the, let's say there is a, um, let's say there is a profit margin from training as well too. And I were to take both of those and then I would invest it into the CrossFit games. You would have to find some sort of way to know that investing into the CrossFit games is going to push people into where training. Now, if you make the argument that, well, people see the CrossFit games and then it fills the affiliates. Right. So like I, I saw it on like ESPN when they would play it at like 11 o'clock in whatever November in between sports. And then I'm like, oh, I'm inspired. I see these people doing these amazing things. Now I'm going to go into my CrossFit affiliate. That's great. There's no way to track that. There's no there's no metric that you could tie that. You're just kind of like hoping that that marketing works and brings people into the affiliates. But here's the problem with that. That might be good for affiliates and you could make that argument. But is that good for CrossFit the company? Now, we've seen CrossFit toggle back and forth between the amount of affiliates. We've seen 15,000 um, touted for a long time. Now we've seen 13,000. We've seen 11,000. We've seen 12,000. We've seen 12,500, right? So the truth probably lies somewhere in between, meaning like there's probably somewhere between 12,500 affiliates and 11,500 affiliates. Let's just say that. So if that's in decline, meaning less and less people are opening affiliates, less and less people are signing up for affiliates. You're going to have less and less revenue from that to plug into the games, which again, we're saying the games is a marketing tool for the affiliates, right? Okay. But if the games are a marketing tool for the affiliates and affiliate ship is in decline, and I, I would just go out on a limb. I don't know this for a fact. I don't have the numbers. I would say certifications are also in a decline. 
now I can just say this because of the L2 I took a couple months back that it was a lot less people in there than there was the first time I took it. And there's a lot less more open available L1s. Back in the day, you would scroll it and for the next like three or four months, it would just be sold out, sold out, sold out. And there was a lot more options to take them at different gyms. So seeing that contraction just from the information I have on the website, I would imagine that certification of the L1 and L2 is also in decline. So if those two things are in decline, but those two things, we take the revenue from that and we fund it into the CrossFit Games. And then our hope is that people get inspired from what they see from the CrossFit Games and then they go into affiliates. That might be good for affiliates, even if you could track it. But then how is that good for CrossFit, the company? And the reason why I bring up this point is if we were all on an airplane together, the whole CrossFit ecosystem, hopefully not a Boeing. <laughs> so if we're all in this, uh, if we're all in this, uh, CrossFit airplane together and we're flying and all of a sudden the plane runs out of food. So everybody in there is hungry and starving. The question would be, if you found a meal or a little bit of food, who gets the food? You got kids, you got babies, you got mothers on there. Who gets to eat inside the plane that's flying over the Atlantic with the whole entire CrossFit ecosystem? And the answer is the pilots. The pilots have to have the meal that they found. Everybody's starving. Some people, yeah, burning cannibalism. Nope, 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 nope. Not in this hypothetical. They all have to eat. They can't, they can't just eat. Matt Frazier, turntable. Great question. <laughs> great, 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 uh, great idea. No, it's the pilots of the airplane. Because if the pilots die because they don't have the food, then for sure everybody dies, right? The plane goes down. But if the pilots are fed, if everybody else inside the plane is still dealing with their issues and are, uh, you know, maybe turning to cannibalism or whatever, that's okay because the plane's still going to get to ultimately where it needs to go and it's going to stay in there and it's going to keep flying. So I use that analogy there because if you think about the CrossFit Games, uh, money being taken from the um, training, money being taken from affiliate revenue and then pumped into the games, then we're not feeding the pilots. And if the affiliates are in decline and training is in decline and those revenue lines subsidize the CrossFit games and they don't reinvest back into affiliates and they don't reinvest back into training, that's essentially giving your the food in that airplane to a couple of the people in the first class seats and not to the pilots. And so what happens if uh, affiliate revenue still still declines? and training revenue still declines, well, then how are they going to continue to subsidize the CrossFit Games? And if the CrossFit Games don't fuel affiliate or training, then at some point, the whole thing kind of falls off a cliff, right? So think about that. ET, with new members, then the base of the pyramid grows. If the pyramid is at the top, it grows if the pyramid is at the top affiliates, middle certifications and trainers and bottom members. Nope. You got it flipped. You got to flip that dude. The, or woman, the bottom of the, that pyramid in this example would be trainers, training certifications. And I'm talking about CrossFit, the company's business model here, I'm not talking about affiliates, I'm talking about CrossFit, the company's business model that at the bottom, it actually at the bottom should be media because that's how they could um, expose everything that they're doing, right? That's how you could control your narrative. That's how you could push a bunch of uh, information out there and get people excited about it. The bottom should be media. The next line would be certifications. The next line after that would be affiliates. And it would move in that order. I would see it. I'd get inspired. I'd go get my cert. I would then um, open an affiliate. And then at the top, you could say that then is members. But you also have to remember that CrossFit doesn't have control over how these affiliates operate. So if you were to put new members at the bottom of the base of that pyramid, which to your point, ET, it kind of looks like they are, you better hope that all those affiliates are doing the proper things to actually make sure that they're holding on to those members. Otherwise, it could be more harmful than it could be good. It could be more harmful than it could be good. Um, continued on from this. Oh, wait, no, that was last thing I was saying. Um, I'm saying if the number at the bottom grows, then the upper grows. Mm -mm. No, 
not for the company. I think the company for the, I think for the company of CrossFit, that certification has to grow because for them, that's the meat and potatoes of their revenue. Like, I don't think that the cross, like, even if the CrossFit games are profitable, I would then ask the question by how much, how much are they profitable by? And I would ask the question of, sorry, I just got a text and I completely lost my, my thought. Oh, and I would ask the question, how much of that profit comes from sponsors? Because that's a shaky thing too, right? But that's a, a, a shaky thing too. But you need new fish to take the certs. Completely agree. Completely agree. And I think that those new fish would all be being exposed to education through media that CrossFit would be cutting out. Because I, you could inspire multiple other people if CrossFit was the authority on fitness. You would start pulling people in that maybe didn't even know CrossFit was for them. But because we're so vocal about the methodology, not the sport, but the methodology and what that could do for you and your health, that you start attracting more people from other different spots of the fitness to come in to take the certs, which again, then immediately then makes revenue for CrossFit. And then after they are gun ho about it and they're like, oh man, I love this. I want to even do my own thing. Or you feed them into other affiliates that are existing, which is great because as you guys know, my um, the biggest thing that I need is qualified great coaches, right? So that's good for the affiliates. You're feeding them, you're feeding them coaches, you're feeding them L1s. But then at the same time, for the CrossFit, the company, as these people go through the certification of the L1, then you start to feed your new affiliate owners, your next generation of new affiliate owners. And clearly they haven't been feeding them as much if certifications and affiliates are in decline. And then if those are in decline, and those are your two lifelines, that is that is your two lifeline of revenue, those two um, um, entities, affiliates and, and certification, if that starts to go away, then it doesn't matter how many people are inside of each CrossFit gym because CrossFit, the company would just, it would just start losing money and they would have to figure out a way to build that revenue back up. Adam, please, Matt, meat and sweet potatoes. You're absolutely, you're right. Adam, please, my sincerest apologies, the meat and sweet potatoes of their revenue of their revenue. Uh, so you think direct certifications before being members uh, is better? Not, it's getting a little conflated here. It's getting a little conflated. I think CrossFit's job is should not be pushing members into affiliates. I think CrossFit's job should be pushing people to their certifications and training and education. And I think that in turn would help the affiliates. So that that's what I think. I hope that answers the question there. Um. Ian, can you wiggle your fingers around like that again for like 30 more seconds? I don't know what I did. What did I do? <laughs> you guys are weird. <laughs> Bernie Gannon, CrossFit Games is a big part of the brand. It's a cool factor. It's the difference between promoting a Lamborghini and a Prius, but will get you from A to B, but there is a difference. Again, I'm not, I agree with that. I do think that there is a cool factor to the CrossFit Games. I enjoyed watching the CrossFit Games CrossFit games a lot. I know that um, there's a certain percentage of people that will come into the affiliates because they saw the uh, CrossFit games. But if it's the cool factor, then maybe you don't need this really big drawn out season. Maybe you just need the ability to qualify into the games, perhaps from other local competitions. Um, and then just have one, one thing that CrossFit puts on. And I would argue that if that one thing was like this uh, fitness festival that also had a bunch of cool stuff like for the affiliates, like they're doing at the games now, then um, then that would help that a little bit. But if you dump a bunch of money into it, like they had been uh, over the years, then you're just, you're stripping revenue away um, where they should be reinvesting, in my opinion, that revenue back into its education uh, and back into its media to um, highlight what's going on. Okay. Anyone thinks the game actually turned people away from affiliates? People seem to think, see that and think that's what's happening inside that. Judy, that's a great point. That's a great point. And again, that's what I was saying. Like, it's hard to have an actual metric on that, right? Like, how do you know, like you can make the argument to Judy's point right here. Like you can make the argument that the CrossFit games is a wash, like because of how many people it turns away versus how many people it turns on towards CrossFit. Like, 
you know, how many people see some of the videos of like what Frazier and what T are doing on there and think, holy shit, there's no way I could do that. That's what they do at that gym up the street from me. No way. But imagine if that media or their first exposure to it was an educational piece and the professionalization of a coach in CrossFit said, here's what all these other things do. Here's what we do. Here's how we professionalize our trainers. Here's what we put into our certifications. Here's what we put into our education. Here's the standard that we expect and that we hold in the L1. And we hope that that transmits to all the affiliates. Imagine if they, if everybody in the public saw that first, do you think that that would have more of a play of bringing people also into affiliates than just seeing the, the very tip of the spear, top of the sport at the CrossFit Games? And people would know more about the education, which would hopefully push uh, more people to do the certifications, which again, as I've said, is going to be the uh, meat and sweet potatoes of CrossFit's revenue. <laughs> uh, Judy, I enjoyed watching the games and all the media stuff for years before I stepped foot into uh, an affiliate because I was scared. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, too, you guys know this, and this is why it was huge that um, we really push to get the behind the scenes back in there is because you're, you're also mostly connecting with the personalities and the people that are the athletes, right? Not just like what they can do, but who they are. Because for me, like once you, once you know them as a person and once, once you know, like who they are, it's so much more fun to like get behind them, right. And to like watch them and watch them succeed and get super involved in all the drama. I mean, look what this story did for Danielle Brandon. I bet she's got so many more fans now. She introduced us to her mom, her closest people around her, told her story, right? And again, imagine if that investment um, from CrossFit came from people that are taking the L1s and people that are inside the affiliates rather than spending the money on having an independent documentary made of the CrossFit Games that nobody has seen yet. Hmm. Wonder what happened with that. Wonder what happened with that. ET, will CrossFit ever advertise on regular TV or YouTube on non-CrossFit related uh, content? Not an ad for the games, but for certifications and affiliates. I hope so. I hope so. Because again, that's where I would be investing. I would be finding different ways to invest in it. Seth Page. Seth, what's up, dude? Um, goes both ways. Agreed it's a wash. I think, yeah, I think it, you could probably argue it's more of a wash than it is like a loss or a gain. I'm super curious how they if they even have the ability to try to find a metric to like track that. Um, Augustus, I think the games attract a bit more of the younger demographic that is closer to the competitive sport. Yeah, agreed. And my roommate told me CrossFit was gay in college, so naturally I tried it and naturally I fell in love with it. How could we turn that into a nationwide, a nationwide marketing piece? <laughs> Tongue in cheek, David, that's kind of funny. CrossFat. I don't know how CrossFit delivers infomercials like that across broadcast media. It would feel like those fake news shows that are trying to sell me a reverse mortgage. <laughs> no, you don't. The The point would be is that how many L... Okay, so here's a good example. How many L1 trainers and Flowmasters do you guys know? Like have you that you've watched on TV, not TV, but like on YouTube or whatever. How many of those L1 staff or Flowmasters um, that have been teaching for forever, right? Like how many of them do you know their stories? How many of them do you know their background, how they got into CrossFit, how they found it, how they became an L1 staff seminar? Like, we don't know any of that. They're not highlighted. They're not, they don't like put them up on a pedestal, right? And on top of that, what about the stories of the people that are inside those L1s that are taking the course? Like, I think Sevon put a little bit of his uh, stuff that he had from the past that he filmed um, right before they fired him, where he was inside there and he was just finding random people inside there and being like, hey, what are you doing here? What are you hoping to gain out of it, right? So if you started to hear those stories of those people who were inspired to come and take the L1 course, or like why they're there, I think that that would be the way that I would advertise it. I would just tell stories and then I would just give away a ton of free information on education. So that way you're like, Hey, you could basically, and that's what they do with L1. Like it's all for free, right? Greg had done that right from the get go. So like you could go find all that information and read it, study it, get fired up and then come in and get, and get certified to take that next step. So that's what I would do in terms of my media. It would, it would be all about the stories of my L1s. I'd make them all superstars, especially, you know, the flow masters that I've been doing for a long time. I would be highlighting them in my media. And then I'd be highlighting some really cool stories 
of the people that are taking the certifications. And then I would apply that same exact uh, content strategy to the affiliates. Like for me, I remember watching David, uh, I think was last name Osorio at CrossFit South uh, Brooklyn. And he's just up there talking through a whiteboard as if like I came in and was like, hey, tell me about how you run your gym, right? To me, in the early affiliate days when I was doing that, I was so starved for that information, not because I needed like a path to follow, but, but I wanted to know what all the other affiliates were doing out there. I wanted to see, you know, what does their classroom look like? How do they set stuff up? How do they even hang their bands on the wall? Like what standard do they hold? So if you started making a ton of media behind um, gyms, all sizes too, like I don't think you have to go to some like 15-year affiliate that has 700 members. In fact, that might not even be a good place to start. You might want to start with like your... 100 or 80 member gym um, that's only been around for you know maybe the last five years or six years or something. But if you just had a, a nice like array of media that was telling the stories inside the affiliates of the owners of side the members and you did the same thing in the L1, uh, I think that that would be a very strong advertisement and it would continue to elevate CrossFit as the authority on exercise science, which should definitely be the route that they're they're going after. They should just like if it was if I was in charge today, I would be like, "Here's what we're doing," and I would send all the media stuff out, and I would start positioning ourselves as the authority on nutrition, on the authority on exercise science, and I wouldn't worry so much about exposing a ton of the corruption. Although there there'd be elements of that in there for sure, because it's like it's sexy and people like it, and we all love a good like oh conspiracy type theory stuff. But I would mostly just be doubling down on all the uh, all the stories. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, hi, Heidi. Brian's show must be over. Welcome. Okay. What did Seth say? Seth usually has great stuff to say, but I scroll past the comment. Uh, uh, doubt it. I believe most broadcasts of the games were time paid to be on ESPN. Then CrossFit has a certain amount of ads they could sell for themselves. Oh, in terms of broadcast stuff. Um, vindicate Matt, there was an agreement with the podcast uh in crossfit for a delayed release of behind the scenes they took forever to promote it how do i answer that and navigate this correctly it took a while to promote but we're very thankful for any promotions that they did thank you crossfit that's how we'll navigate that um okay Matt, I like when you have a guest. <laughs> She's trolling me again. It's these backhanded compliments that stare at my insecurities. CrossFat, I think a call to action to members to enjivalize <laughs> for CrossFit would help a lot. I think I've coached 10 members that heard about it via a friend, via someone who saw the games in this era. Yeah, I agree. Get your, that's how most people come in word of mouth they get a friend do you technically need an l1 to co to coach at an affiliate if the owner of the uh, the gym is in there while you're coaching asking for a friend are you the friend brandon <laughs> um i think insurance purpose wise i do think that if there's an l1 in the building you could have somebody else coaching it and then that covers you i remember that being something in the past um so yeah i think that's i think that's how that goes i think that's how that goes uh, Dan Guerrero, there's so many flow masters that it'd be much more interesting to hear from than the games athletes. Yeah. And dude, there's been so many that have been around for a while that speak so well, so intelligently, they articulate stuff so good that I think it'd be awesome to um, hear their stories and uh, everything else. Um, careful, Matt. <laughs> Heidi, that was mean. What'd she say? Oh, that she likes it when I have guests on. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's mean about that? Him and Irene Greg, Greg Glassman was great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Heidi, why would you not want to have your L1 in coach? Good point. Usually, uh, CrossFat, usually insurance requires someone in the building. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, CPT. What's up, dude? Uh, I'd like a 10-part series with Chuck Carswell. Seriously, right? Seriously. That's what I'm talking about. Um, Alejandro, not the main authority on exercise science, but in producing elite fitness. Even Greg said it, we're not in the business of advancing. We're in the business of advancing human performance. Sure. 
Sure. But I think like in today and today's uh, day and age where everything's based off the appeal to authority that you want to have the credibility and you want to have the authority and then that will um, that will help push everything along in terms of uh, mainstream popularity. Matt, do you think the Flowmasters should also be or have been affiliate owners? No, I don't. I know a lot of them like either were or had been at some point, but if they're just teaching the material of the L1, I don't think so. Um, but I see your point. I see your point. I had to put a little bit more thought to that. But uh, initially, I'm thinking like, no, but I don't know. That's a good question. Because ideally, you're just teaching the material that's in the L1, right? But when you go to the L2, you are teaching like classroom logistics and seeing and correcting movement and all that type of stuff. Um, so you would think that they would have some experience in that outside of just teaching it in a controlled environment of the certification. Because teaching it in a controlled environment of a certification where everybody's paid a lot of money to be there for the weekend to learn and get information is a different experience than when you're like trying to herd cats at your 8 a.m. class with a bunch of chatty members. So interesting question. Um, what did I say? They were T saying to do nothing with they were saying to coach. I don't I don't get it. Um without it, it gives me the same vibe as a professor with no practical knowledge, uh, only academic. Great point. And that's why I kind of like stop myself from that just like answering straight up like yeah um or no rather but you're right i do think there's a little bit of like the academic theory stuff there versus like the practice but i would say I, that's an interesting question i wonder how many of the flow masters and stuff like that are actually uh did own or currently own um crossfit gyms i know the few of them that so when i went to my l2 i had um austin bing bing in and i had zach pine both of them were um flow master has been working for a long time and both like austin is a current affiliate owner and has been for like 15 years and zach pine owned crossfit aptos for many years before he sold it um and then the other guy fuck, i forget his name but he was also an affiliate owner as well too so all three of them two of them were current affiliate owners and the other one had run an affiliate for like um, eight years nine years and all of them had been um l1 staff seminar for like 15 plus years. So in my experience with them, they were uh, affiliate owners. I miss when, uh, Ian, I miss when CrossFit would put out videos of games athletes doing the wad. I remember watching the video of Dan Bailey doing a running workout, maybe double unders pull-ups around HQ. I remember that video too. Yes, you're right. That was also really important. It was important too, because they used to visit gyms for the wad demos back in the day. I was talking about this when I was on, was, was on a Seth's um, show, which you guys should all go check that out, by the way. The show is really cool that he does on YouTube and it needs like way more um, traction. So if you guys haven't, uh, I'll bring it up here. Not that. Um, uh, jumped ship. If you guys haven't, go check out his. Um, uh, let me bring it up. Sorry. Here it is here. If you guys haven't, go check go check this out. You guys will like it. Um, Seth goes through a lot of these old videos here and uh, breaks them down. And one of the things that I said when I was on the show with him was like, dude, I love those WAD demos because you got to see how the affiliate like ran its classes. I, I would always be like looking in the background for like different stuff to pick up to bring back to my affiliate. And uh, it was definitely cool when they did it with games athletes. But it was really cool for me just to watch it with just the normal run of the mill members just at like random gyms that they would go visit and be like, here's the CrossFit.com workout of the day. And here's this CrossFit gym doing it. That stuff was cool. Uh, Bernie Gannon, Seth show is actually enjoyed his interview with you. Yeah, it kind of, it was weird. It didn't turn into an, it kind of like turned into an interview and I'll take responsibility for that. There was no talk of like any, him interviewing me at all or vice versa. We just were going to break down and watch one of the old videos. And I started taking it all over the place and totally derailed the show. Sorry. Sorry about that, Seth. Um, so yeah, uh, go check that out. But I talked a little bit about that on that. Okay. I'm going to end, um, Matt hijacked the show. I'm sorry, Seth. I totally did. Fuck. I felt bad afterwards and I was thinking about it. I was like, not only did I just start like taking it in all these different directions and I was like watching some of it back, which I normally never do. Like I, I never watch these shows back cause I just get 
crazy like secondhand embarrassment by it but i was like watching some of that back and um i would just totally derail the left field and seth would just kind of like chill there and be like that's a good point and i'm like fuck we're supposed to be here to watch the video and here i go on some like rant anyhow thanks for having me on dude everybody go over there subscribe to it watch his stuff it's really cool uh okay i won't leave you guys hanging I'll, we're gonna end with this by the way i had some more notes on like the crossfit versus affiliate and training and how that if we pulled the revenue away from that, would CrossFit be able to stand on its own and uh, the CrossFit Games be able to stand on its own and survive and be profitable and um, everything else? And uh, I, I think I beat that one down pretty good with the bat here. I put some more like hypothetical figures and stuff down, but we won't go through um, all of them now. And uh, yeah, I got to get permission if I could share some of the other cool stuff with you guys first. I got to check with the overlords, you know what I mean? Um, this I will leave you guys with, though. This is just a, a very small sneak peek. I think this video will be coming out soon. Um, bring this up. Boom. Uh, okay. Here we go. This is a teaser. And if you guys told anybody that I showed you this, I'm it's oh fuck it, I'm gonna deny it. The state capital of California. We're getting a resolution. Anyhow. Lots of cool conversations with Dave. That's Bill Saley. He's the assemblyman that pushed the bill through. This is us talking about other politicians here. Uh, let's see. See, there's a cool part here. I just like that shot of Dave. Farming uh, yeah. legislation. Farmer, farming lobby. Hello. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm getting here. recognized at Starbucks. I am originally from LA. Moved to Sacramento for a bit. Anyhow, all right. That's all I could show you guys. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, oh, that's going to be a hype video. Can't wait. Thanks, Susie. Yeah. Got to film that one myself. Matt, whatever happened to your entertaining... Um, what do you call it? Uh, mattress commercials. Yeah, Sleep 8. That was a temporary one. Those commercials too, by the way, are done for the um, audio version of the podcast. It's it's funny. I don't know. Um, Susan, will this show uh, always be on your channel now too? Yep, it streams here. It streams to my Twitter or X or whatever. And I keep it on. Um, I keep them all archived also on my uh, um, personal channel. There's not really much on there. So... Don't worry about it. Seth Page, can't wait for that video. It's pretty cool. Uh, Heidi Kroom, uh, love watching Dave flirt with various women. <laughs> it was funny because the there was a there was a handful of people that came up that recognized them that got a photo, especially after we got like announced by the assemblymen where like we stood up and like everybody applauded. Like people came right up to where we were sitting there and like got photos with them. All women. All women. It was uh, pretty funny. Um, Susan, we need another hour. Thanks, Heidi. And I always appreciate your troll comments. Nobody, nobody take it too serious. If I, I'm not getting, I'm never getting mad at her. It's all right. Okay, guys, I got to run. I got a 12, 1230 meeting. Um, that is it. That is all. That is all. I will, uh, I will see you guys next Tuesday. If I don't see you before that, as always, super appreciate all you guys that come in here and hang out with me at 11 on Tuesday. Um, super cool that you guys do that, especially with uh, all the other show options and everything else. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Be good to each other out there. That's all we got. That's all we got is each other. Be good. Be safe.